Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Rob Mathia. I am on the faculty in the ministry department of the seminary and also part of the Faith Matters Committee. The Faith Matters is a lecture series we have here at APU to highlight voices from within our School of Theology. We feel like uh, so many of our professors have something that contribute, can contribute to um, the conversation here in the university. As I introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Justin Ashworth, I think of the words of, of Mordecai that he spoke to uh, Queen Esther when she was faced the risk of being killed if she went to the king on behalf of her people. And, uh, but she also had the, the chance to save them from dis destruction. And Mordecai said to her that perhaps she was in that position for such a time as this. Given the national discourse on immigration and the way that individual lives are being impacted by that discourse, I would suggest that perhaps we have Dr. Ashworth for just such a time as this. Uh, Dr. Ashworth is an assistant professor in the Department of Theology, and his particular emphasis in his research and writing is on immigration and Latin American theologies. He has traveled and taught in Peru and Guatemala, although he did want me to let you know he used a translator, <laughs> but he is hoping to become fluent in Spanish. That's on his to-do list. He's currently working on a book titled Belonging Without Borders, The Ethics of Borders and the Mission of the Church. So his topic tonight, we're blessed to have him speak to us because this is in his sweet spot. On a personal note, he grew up in Southern California and became interested in immigration issues uh, and uh, in, a, in a racially and culturally diverse K-12 and university experience. He is uh, a committed member of the Presbyterian Church USA, and that's the denomination in which his wife is uh, being ordained, and she's going to be joining us here in a little bit. Uh, let's welcome Dr. Justin Ashworth. Thanks, Rob, for the introduction. Um, I didn't expect to be um, mentioned in the same breath as Mordecai, um, <laughs> but I will take it. I will take it. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks to the Faith Matters um, Committee, I think you said for inviting me to do this. Um, I see some friends, some former students, some current students, uh, some family. Very thankful that uh, everybody is here and that I get to share some uh, thoughts with you all. Um, I do feel, uh, even though I feel a little bit uncomfortable um, being mentioned in the same breath as Mordecai, I do feel like uh, my own research interests have always, uh, ever since I got interested in them, there has just been summer after summer, year after year, when uh, some sort of immigration controversy bubbles up and explodes. And this summer, two such controversies bubbled up and exploded. And I'm going to talk to uh, you all about both of those uh, today. And to do so, I want to begin with a story, actually two stories. The first one has to do with a, a young boy named Daoud and his separated but married parents. So, as of July 17th, 2018, a mother of a 13-year-old kid was stuck in a country not her own, on the other side of planet Earth from her son and her husband. Back in early June, she had some hopes that she could be reunited with her family in the nearish future. Now, she has little prospect of seeing them ever again. The woman named Malika is married to a U.S. citizen. Their 13-year-old son is named Daoud. Daoud had recently come to the U.S. from Yemen to be reunited with his father. Daoud's mom, Malika, on the other hand, was barred from coming to the U.S. despite being married to a U.S. citizen. Daoud and his dad live in uh, Michigan, while Malika is currently in Djibouti, on the east coast of Africa, next to Ethiopia, sandwiched between Eritrea and Somalia, and just across the sea, importantly, from Yemen. Yemen is Daoud and Malika's home country. Yemen is also the site of horrendous war, a war that started back in 2015. Malika and Daoud fled for Djibouti because of this war, along with about 280,000 other people 
who have sought asylum in nearby Djibouti or Somalia. More than three million people in Yemen have been internally displaced, living, uh, leaving their homes for another part of the country. Around 50,000 people have died since the war began, and the vast majority of those, about 80%, are civilians. The vast majority of those civilians were killed by Saudi UAE, United Arab Emirates, uh, co coalition airstrikes. Coalition airstrikes that um, were fueled, uh, the ships had American-made bombs on them and were fueled with American fuel. Cholera has also broken out with around 120,000 cases in 2018. Famine has plagued the country, in part because the country is so poor, but also in part because the country relies heavily on imports, and the Saudi coalition has set up a blockade to keep food out of the country. They are literally starving them to death. Violence, disease, poverty, malnutrition, there is little wonder why people would want to flee the country. Despite Yemen's circumstances, Yemenis have been barred from coming to the U.S because of President Trump's travel ban. Yemen is one of five Muslim-majority countries banned from entering uh, the United States. President Trump issued a first executive order within days of inauguration. Then, when that one was challenged in the courts, he issued another. And then, when that one was challenged in the courts, he issued another, Executive Order 3. States tried to block the ban and thus to allow people from these countries to uh, enter the U.S., but the administration appealed and their case eventually made it to the Supreme Court, or SCOTUS. I sometimes say SCOTUS because it's shorter, plus it sounds kind of cool. Um, that uh, case that was decided in uh, the Supreme Court is called Trump v. Hawaii. Um, over the summer, SCOTUS upheld the ban, which permits it to stay in effect uh, for the foreseeable future. The travel ban, they said, concerned matters of national security. National security, and it's not up to the courts to determine what constitutes a national security threat. Now, we could say a lot about the travel ban and the basis for SCOTUS upholding it, but before doing that, I'd like to tell another story of family separation. Uh, for the last two years, um, a woman, uh, a young woman in my small group, we weren't in the small group together for two years, we were in the small group together for six months, but the woman was doing this work I'm about to tell you about for two years. Needed to clarify that. Um, this young woman that uh, I was in a small group with was uh, working with as an attorney with an organization called Public Counsel, which is the nation's largest uh, pro bono law firm. Over the sun, my friend became distraught as she started to hear news of families being separated at the U.S.-Mexico border, and as she and Public Counsel eventually filed a lawsuit on behalf of three women against Attorney, Jeff, uh, attorney General Jeff Sessions and others in the Trump administration. She regularly, my friend, regularly expressed anxiety and sadness, grief and terror over what might happen to these three mothers and to their children, whose uh, case she was arguing. But her own anxiety, as uh, profound as that was, couldn't compare to the anxiety and sadness, the trauma that these women had suffered, um, the women whom she represented. And their own trauma couldn't compare to the anxiety and sadness and trauma that the thousands of families who had been separated had felt. Hundreds of those families have yet to be reunited. Now, the women in my friend's lawsuit had fled violence in Central America, and they had come to the U.S. in search of asylum. This is a perfectly legal thing to do. And it's the responsibility of the U.S. government to process asylum claims as quickly as they can before determining whether the claimants are eligible for asylum. The U.S. government did not do this. Instead, they separated thousands of children from their parents, often sending children and parents, uh, or children or parents to one state while detaining the other in another state. So for example, the women in this case were being held in California and Washington, their children were in Arizona and Texas. Hundreds of other parents were deported to the, uh, by the U.S. government to Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, 
uh, Honduras, um, often without knowing why they were being deported or what was going to happen to them, all while their children stayed in the U.S. Naturally, this has resulted in all manner of confusion and extreme difficulty in reuniting parents and children. As of mid-September, and I haven't seen recent st uh, statistics in the last three weeks, uh, more than 200 children had yet to be re reunited with any relative. Still 200. So beyond the apparent cruelty of these policies, they have three legal flaws. Now these are just legal flaws. We're not talking about morality here. We're talking about law. Those are two different things, right? Important to keep that in mind. Uh, the first thing is that separated parents and children are supposed to be allowed contact with each other or with family members, and this was not happening. Some families didn't speak to each other for weeks or even months. Children are also, according to law, supposed to be put in the least restrictive conditions possible. This is in what's called the Flores Settlement. You can look that up later. You probably won't, but um, I'll, I'll give you some information on that right now. Basically, children are supposed to be put in the least restrictive conditions possible, and this too was not happening because there are allegations of terrible living conditions um, inside detention facilities, including children not being able to go outside at all, um, or uh, very little. The last thing is that children are supposed to be placed uh, with family or close friends, relatives, if not with their parents, instead of being detained by themselves. And that was not happening either. So there are several legal problems with um, this family separation that was occurring. At the end of this presentation, I uh, want to re return to the lawsuit that my friend was working on. Um, but for now, I want to unpack some of these heartbreaking stories. It's important for us to begin with these stories um, to, uh, to, to understand the sheer, the raw emotion behind them. But we also have to put them in context because these didn't arise in a vacuum. And so I want us to think critically about these policies um, and to put them in two contexts. The first context is what's called securitization theory. Securitization theorists say this, that security is a speech act by means of which an actor presents an issue as an existential threat that justifies extraordinary measures to neutralize that threat. So basically, you call someone a terrorist. And this gives you license to use massive military, surveillance, and political force to neutralize that threat. Or you name certain people drug dealers and rapists, and you constantly rail against those countries as hotbeds of gang activity before you deploy military and political force to keep those people out. When you declare something a security threat, in other words, you draw a line in the sand between people who don't belong, or people who belong as friends, and people who don't belong because they're enemies. Calls for security are powerful, right? Some of us have lost loved ones to violence. They're powerful because we don't want to be subject to violence. When we call something a security threat, and when we have examples of that threat, we can hold up those examples in order to justify the use of military and political force against these so-called threats, and all of that we can do whether or not the people under consideration are in fact security threats at all. Now one problem with securitization is that there are very few checks and balances. If the president or Congress calls something a security threat, the Supreme Court is unlikely to second guess that president. This is called judicial deference. The judiciary defers to the president's judgment in matters of national security. Now, judicial deference was in place long before, long before President Trump. In the U.S., migration policy is understood as part of a sovereign nation's right to defend itself, and the executive branch, the president, is the chief protector of national sovereignty. This means, this means, this is crucial, that migration policies are necessarily, or they necessarily construe migrants as outsiders, who may threaten our well-being. They are potential enemies, potential threats. They're not people looking for work. 
not people seeking asylum, not people who want to belong here. They are security threats. That's lodged in the American uh, immigration authority system. <laughs> Securitization was behind both Trump v. Hawaii and the zero tolerance policy, which is um, the family separation policy. In the one, people from five predominantly Muslim countries were deemed threatening, and the courts did not question that judgment. In the other, the Trump administration uh, had constantly associated people from Latin America with violence and criminality, and they tried to get us to view such folks as threats to our security. Now again, President Trump was not the first to do this, but his, his administration's practices do give us um, a clear example of securitization. So, to make clear that President Trump was not the first to do this, I have a quote about securitization from 2008. Back in 2008, uh, a legal scholar named Jennifer Chacon said that the rhetoric of national security is used to justify the ongoing expansion of the immigration enforcement apparatus and the implementation of harsh new immigration regu regulations that have increasingly criminalized migrants. You call something a national security threat and you justify the use of force. Now, I don't think we could use any word other than harsh to describe the policies that led to the family separation stories that I started with. Those were harsh. They were expansions, moreover, of the government's immigration authority that had terrible life consequences for people who, frankly, do not obviously pose any serious existential threat. It's not clear how the people who suffer because of this pose an existential threat. So that's securitization theory. The second thing I want to talk about is called membership theory. Membership theory says that it is legitimate for us to treat non-citizens and citizens differently. So how do I have it up here? It's different there from here. So let me read this. Members of this community have rights that non-members don't have. Certain rights and privileges should be denied non-citizens simply because they are not part of the people. So let me give you some examples. Racial profiling. Immigration officers are legally permitted to use racial profiling against non-citizens in a way that police officers are not supposed to do. Are not supposed to do against citizens. Non-citizens' property is not protected from unreasonable searches and seizures. Fourth Amendment? Fifth? Fourth? Fourth. Let's go with fourth. I think it's the Fourth <coughs> Amendment. Anyway. Um, Non-citizens are also subject to detention or confinement for far more reasons than citizens are. And penalties for breaking laws are harsher for non-citizens than they are for citizens. In a, uh, in a 1976 case called Matthews v. Diaz, the Supreme Court decided that in the exercise of its broad power over naturalization and immigration, Congress regularly makes rules that would be unacceptable if applied to citizens. That's just legit in law. That's in our laws. That's legal. This is membership theory. At least some of the rights and privileges of citizens do not apply to non-citizens. Your treatment in this country depends upon your legal status. So, if we're to understand the immigration controversies of the summer of 2018, we have to place them in the context of securitization theory and membership theory. And essentially, migrants are construed as threatening outsiders, and outsiders do not deserve to be treated as citizens. So you can keep a woman separated from her family because she's from a country deemed threatening, and she's not a member of our community. You can separate children from parents or relatives because they're from a country deemed threatening and they're not a member of our community. Now, as important as, as it is for us to think critically about these matters, we also are here at a Christian institution to think theologically about them. And that's what I'm here to do, is to help us think theologically about these things. And I want to discuss three ways in which to think theologically, and the first is how not to think theologically. So let's begin with this. 
Um, unfortunately, a lot of our preaching, a lot of the preaching that we hear in churches um, is indebted to this. And I hear this from, um, from uh, students all the time. I don't mean to slam people who have this view, but I do intend to help us nuance it a little bit more. All right? So let's get nuanced. Attorney General Jeff Sessions stated this line in his response to criticisms of the family separation policy. He said, I would um, cite Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Now, the Sessions line is a particular reading of this passage. Here's how he interprets it. Orderly and lawful processes are good in themselves. Consistent, fair application of law is in itself a good and moral thing, and it protects the weak, it protects the lawful. Our policies that can result in temporary, short-term separation of families is, he did say is, uh, not unusual or unjustified. Though, to be fair, when you're standing in front of people, you often use the wrong uh, verb tense. Or Anyway, um, now, there are a bunch of critical questions you could ask about the family separation policy, like, uh, was it orderly? Not even close. Was it lawful? Probably not. Was it consistent and fair? No. Did it protect the weak? Hardly. Right? You could ask a bunch of different questions about this. But let's focus, focus uh, on the theological issues at stake. The first is what Paul doesn't say in this passage. Paul does not say that every law a governing authority creates is instituted by God. Paul does not say that. Paul says only that all authority comes from God and therefore is subject to God. Christians have always thought that certain laws should be changed and Romans 13 does nothing to convince them otherwise. Certain laws need to be changed. Christian critique of laws is perfectly compatible with submission to those laws. Submission here simply means not obedience necessarily, but accepting the consequences of one's criticism. Accepting the consequences, perhaps, of civil disobedience. Moreover, there are alternative visions of government authority in Scripture. This is not the only way in which Scripture imagines government authority, and the Roman uh, imperial authority in particular. So Revelation 13, for example, imagines imperial authority as the work of the dragon. This government blasphemes God and makes war on the saints. This is not good government. Why didn't we pick that passage? <laughs> I, have, I have some thoughts on why we picked the other one. So, the early church was martyred for its resistance to imperial pressures. Sometimes, that's what has to happen. So people who wield Romans 13 as if it were Christian's last word on the relationship between political and divine authority, such folks neglect crucial strands of scripture that highlight the perils of political authority. One of my former teachers uh, says this about uh, government authority in the early church. She, she says, uh, the history of the church's relationship with the governing authorities unfolds from its very beginnings at the fraught intersection of apprehension and acceptance, collaboration and separation, Revelation 13 and Romans 13. There is no one thing called the Christian understanding of the state. That's important for us to remember. So in short, the Sessions line misreads the passage, number one, and offers only one side of the story of God's relationship with governing authorities. That, my friends, is bad theology. That's bad theology. Now, there are two other ways of thinking theologically about these controversies, ways that I think are a little bit subtler. The first is political theology. And here I want to talk about the gods we worship. And by, yeah, that's intended to be a little bit provocative. Um, the term political theology means many things to many people, and it can be done in a number of different ways. I'm going to do it in a sort of analytical mode, hopefully you'll get this in a sec, um, and a constructive mode. 
My way of doing po uh, political theology in an analytical mode is to look at what we actually worship when we make certain political decisions. The key question to ask is which god or gods are we worshiping? What do we consider worthy of our time and our treasure and our talents when we make this or that political decision, when we enact this or that law? Or as I put it up here, to what do we ascribe worth? Worship is the key word because to, to worship is to ascribe worth to something. It's to say this is worthy of my attention. This deserves my money and my time. To what do we ascribe worth when we enact these policies? What do these policies say about where our loyalties lie? What we are most committed to? Whom or what we consider most worthy of our resources? And the answer in these cases is pretty obvious. We ascribe worth to cultural stability and national security. Notice a few things about the people who suffer from these policies. They're from countries that people often consider very different from the US. So different that it's not, it's not clear whether they can assimilate. They might destabilize our culture. As they might say in the South, that we might should keep them out. because they might destabilize our culture. They're also folks who are associated with violence and terrorism in the media, with gangs, that MS-13, those animals. Violence looms on the horizon here. And so physical security and cultural stability are the gods we worship when we enact these policies. But these, friends, are not gods worth worshiping. They are not gods worth separating families over. They're not gods worth treating people without regard for constitutional norms that apply to citizens. These gods, national security and cultural stability, they are idols, and they cannot deliver on their promises. So that's political theology done in an analytical mode. What do we worship? What do we actually worship? Yeah, we say we worship the triune God, but what do we actually worship in this policy? Now I want to say a little bit about security and belonging from a constructive theological perspective. And I want to begin by orienting us around the gospel. Because Christian theology is not Christian theology unless it's reflection on the gospel. Anything we say about security and belonging will have to be ori uh, oriented around this basic understanding of Christian commitment. So I'm just going to hazard an answer to the question, what is the gospel? This is my interpretation. We can debate it, whatever. Um, but I think we're going to agree on some basic things here. In Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit, God has, number one, defeated the forces that alienate human beings from God and each other, and number two, made communion with God and each other possible. Pretty straightforward. God overcomes alienation and makes communion possible. Uh, so in this view, salvation is eternal communion with God and each other in Jesus Christ, given to us by the Holy Spirit. This type of salvation was at hand, even if only provisionally when Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes to feed hungry people, when he restored a leper not only to health, but also to full belonging in his community, when he raised a little girl from the dead and restored her to her family. In all of these instances, God's royal power was on display in overcoming alienation and healing broken community. Salvation consists in restored healed, perfected communion with God and each other in Jesus Christ. And crucially, God gives us foretastes of that communion now. Even though those foretastes are imperfect here and now. So with this understanding of the gospel in mind, I'd like to make a couple of comments about security and belonging. 
And they go like this. Foreigners are not threats to our security. They are simply distant neighbors who have come near. That's it. Not threats. And I'll make that argument theologically and with just a little data. Um, and secondly, Christians should seek restored, healed communion for all people, regardless of their citizenship status. So, these, uh, number one goes against securitization theory, number two goes against membership theory. If you can sort of remember back to that. So in the 4th and 5th century, I actually, I, I realized as I was going over this, I cite Augustine a couple times in here, and I'm not like the biggest fan of Augustine, but man, he can do some good work for you at times. So I'm going to put Augustine to work here. Anyway, um, St. Augustine distinguished eternal security from earthly security. He did this in a number of letters to powerful people who were worried about how to govern cities. The peace of the earthly city, said Augustine, is the temporary peace and security that all of us want in this life. We all want it. No one wants to live in an unjust, violent, war-torn, divided society. This is why people flee their home countries. So we do well to pursue earthly peace. But we should not make earthly peace into an idol. The security that matters most, according to Augustine, is that true peace which can be understood in his words as a perfectly ordered and wholly concordant fellowship in the enjoyment of God and of each other in God. So if that's our true peace, do migrants threaten our security? On the one hand, in terms of eternal security, the answer is obviously no. Even if the people affected by the travel ban and the zero tolerance policy were drug dealers and terrorists, even if they were, and we have every reason to believe that they were not. But even if they were, even then, they couldn't threaten our security in God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Remember, that's in the Bible, y'all. <laughs> not even drug dealers and rapists can do that. Not even terrorists can separate us from the love of God. On the other hand, in terms of temporal security, the peace of the earthly city, we could ask whether migrants threaten the earthly city with violent crime or terrorism. And here i got to drop a little bit of statistics on you. The answer here is another no. There's much evidence to suggest that resident non-citizens are less threatening, less violent than citizens. Let me give you just a couple of them. David Newart of the Center for Investigative Reporting found that white nationalists, since 2008, I think, is uh, when this study began, are more dangerous than Islamists in the US. Let me give you three statistics on why. White nationalists have committed more crimes, 115 uh, attacks versus 63 attacks from Islamists. They've been criminally charged half as frequently, 35% criminally charged. 35% of the white nationalists, 75% of the Islamists. And they have far more expansive networks and more vigorous recruiting methods. Similarly, numerous studies have found that citizens are two to three times as likely as non-citizens to be incarcerated. Two to three times as likely. So um, among, I think the numbers go like this, about one and a half of every thousand, yeah, this is how it goes, one and a half of every thousand citizens um, are incarcerated. About half of a person per thousand uh, non-citizen are incarcerated. I'm trying to explain that math. Just remember the two to three times as much. We'll, ju we'll just go with that. Uh, the math makes sense in my head. My spouse can tell you that I'm terrible at explaining math um, to people. It makes sense here, but anyway. So citizens are two to three times as likely to be incarcerated as non-citizens. So do non-citizens threaten the peace of the earthly city? No. Not as much as citizens do.
But I also think that we have to understand the, 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 the potential problem of cultural instability. And Christians should not feel threatened by cultural instability either, even if non-citizens uh, non do bring it. And there are questions about whether they do. For Christians, cultural diversity is not something to be feared. It's an essential marker of our identity as church. The church is a people scattered among the nations to proclaim the gospel. And it's a people gathered from those nations in obedience to the gospel. And here I'm going to use Augustine again. He says, so long as this heavenly city is a pilgrim on earth, the church is a pilgrim people. The church is a pilgrim people. It calls forth citizens from all peoples and gathers together a pilgrim society of all languages. Cultural diversity is inherent in the church's identity, not stability. Christians should not fear cultural differences. So all of this means that we should not talk about migrants with such fraught terms as threat, insecurity, instability. Instead, migrants can be called distant neighbors coming near and people with whom we are destined for fellowship. A lot of those people crossing that border are Christians, y'all. A lot of them are Christians. They might be uh, populating the new heavens and the new earth with you someday. So this, I think, is a better way of understanding the migrant theologically. So any other way of imagining migrants is going to have to contend with this theological definition. Don't tell me migrants are threatening unless you can make that case theologically. And good luck. I'd love to hear your case for why migrants are threatening theologically. Let's just talk theology, though. So the second point I want to make has to do with belonging and its responsibilities. The basic argument is this. If God's future for us is restored communion with God and neighbor, and if God makes that communion possible, even if only provisional, here and now, then we must do everything in our power, everything in our power, to participate in God's mission of restoring communion wherever it's broken. This makes Christians responsible for bringing healing to all forms of societal brokenness, especially those in which they are immediately implicated. And to all of the Christians who are U.S. citizens in this room, that means you. That means you. All of us are responsible for these policies, whether or not we voted for Donald Trump, whether or not we're happy that Jeff Sessions is Attorney General. I don't mean that we are to blame, but I do mean that it is within our power to affect these policies. Back in June, just before Father's Day, the eminent theologian Stephen Colbert um, <laughs> addressed this issue on The Late Show after telling the audience that the U.S. was separating families at the southern border, he said this, the United States, that is you and me. We are putting up with our government saying to immigrants, if you come to the United States, the worst thing imaginable will happen to you. We will take your children away from you with no guarantee that you'll ever see them again. The, the United States, that's you and me. We are responsible, everyone in here, for these policies because we have opportunities to change them through our organizing, through our voting, through our speaking to people in high places and to people in low places, through our speaking to people in churches and in schools. And on that note, I want to talk about, I want to close by reflecting just a little bit on a few things that some folks have been doing um, to, um, to bring healing to these wounds. So here are just a few things um, that I want to mention, and then I'll sort of gesture towards a final one. So numerous Christian leaders have issued statements opposing the policies that I've talked about, either to their immediate constituents or to the wider world. For example, right here at APU, back in late June, President Wallace wrote a sorrowful email to the APU community when families were being separated. He was genuinely disturbed 
by this. And he wrote us uh, almost like in tears about this. This caused him genuine pain. A few days later, Jim Wallace, no relation, um, of Sojourners mag uh, Magazine, also spelled different, he wrote an opinion piece denouncing SCOTUS's decision in the travel ban case. Uh, he denounced it as a hypocritical endorsement of religious discrimination by the leaders of a party that ostensibly takes the free exercise of religion seriously, but seems to have forgotten that um, at this point. Then also the Evangelical Immigration Table has criticized both the family separations and stingy refugee resettlement policies in the U.S. These are examples of Christian leaders, of powerful institutions, using their platform to speak the gospel, uh, gospel truth into a setting of broken communion. There are also lawsuits in the court system. Uh, my lawyer friend, whom I mentioned earlier, she was working to help uh, these mothers um, to obtain three things. Number one, reunification. They just wanted the families to be reunited. Number two, release from detention. And number three, remedial medical care. To help them to heal psychologically from the trauma of being separated, um, both mothers uh, from their children and the, and the children from their mothers. Uh, all parties need healing from this trauma. My friend did this work because of her Christian faith. Other lawyers are working on a smaller scale, offering their services in smaller ways. For example, doing pro bono work to help immigrants uh, fill out technical and difficult paper, uh, paperwork, or offering free legal advice for people who need answers to immediate questions. And then, finally, there are several church initiatives going on right now. Um, and I'll mention just one um, uh, through what's called the Matthew 25 SoCal Network. Anybody know Matthew 25? Yeah. All right, M25, doing cool stuff. I mentioned earlier, but a lot of us don't know. Let's, let me remind you, hundreds of children are still separated from their parents. And that's several, several months after this initial separation. And it's really difficult to find parents who have been deported. Super hard. You're going to walk all around the rural areas of, of Guatemala or Honduras or other places trying to find these people who have been deported. One of my friends at Matthew 25 tells me that they're working with families and churches to offer temporary uh, foster care for separated families. Um, and uh, uh, and they're, they're trying to help uh, these churches to be approved um, to, or, or certified to offer daycare so that a family uh, temporarily fosters um, a migrant child, um, but then also there is a, a, a daycare for those families um, who have to work. Um, and so this situation, of, this doesn't solve the, the tragic situation of separation, but I am very thankful to know that there's a group like Matthew 25 doing this important work of bringing communion in the midst of alienation and trauma. So there's much work left to do to improve the lives of people affected by these immigration-related policies of the last summer. Um, I'm particularly cognizant of the legal challenges that have to take place, or the legal changes, sorry, that have to take place so that the type of suffering that we've been discussing doesn't happen again. We need to pressure people with power, including the Supreme Court. Sometimes the Supreme Court responds to pressure to get them to overturn Trump v. Hawaii and to reorient immigration policy away from national security concerns and towards other things like economics or refugee issues or citizenship matters. We need the U.S. government to be held accountable for the suffering they've inflicted, the suffering that we have allowed them to inflict on the families that have been separated. This suffering is going to have long-term effects on people. We need legal remedies for these, Ill, Ill, for these ills, even though such remedies will not bring the full scope of healing that is needed. And yet, even in the face of all the work that remains to be done, perhaps you 
are, like me, inspired by Christian leaders, by Christian lawyers and churches and families who are attempting to bring healing to people whose lives are broken by harsh immigration laws. And so I hope that these folks can be an example to us all. Thank you. Um, so this might be opening up a whole other can of worms, so you can just say no in response to my question. Um, but thinking about membership theory, yeah. right, and the idea of treating citizens and not citizens differently. I'm wondering if it's complicated at all by the idea of uh, the kind of response to the devastation of Puerto Rico, for example, right? Um, and whether uh, the idea of citizenship um, is complicated by perceptions uh, or perceptions of citizen, citizenship are complicated by, the, by race, basically, racial identification. Uh, one of the things that I had to cut out of here um, that I had wanted to talk about is that both of these matters, securitization and membership theory, are both highly racialized, and they always have been. Citizenship in the U.S. started off, and for a very long time, was, you know, only for white people. And um, the history of immigration policy uh, helped to solidify and consolidate that notion of um, uh, whiteness as a prerequisite for um, citizenship. And so even though it's the case that um, you don't have to be white to be um, a member of the U.S. Um, sort of legally, once you get to questions of how someone is treated, then you have questions about second-class citizenship and who gets treated like a full member. Um, and so the question of Puerto Rico is very complicated, and I'm going to sort of sidestep that just a little bit um, because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, quite sure about um, how it fits in um, to all of this. But the one thing I can say on that is that um, I think absolutely it's the case that um, U.S. Americans totally forget about Puerto Rico as um, sort of a member of our polity. Um, and that has everything to do with language and race and culture. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you. Do you make a distinction between um, naturalized citizens and citizens? Um, do you make a distinction between those who have come to this country and are residents, uh, legal residents? Because legal residents do not necessarily have all the benefits of, True. of a naturalized citizen, mm -hmm. but they're still legal and they can do just about anything except voting. Does that enter into your, in, in, into your uh, crockies of, of membership and participation? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, um, so I guess my question is, uh, what is the, uh, the, the role that you want it to play? I'm curious, like, what, what, you're, um, what you're interested in um, that distinction playing. Can I, can I hear, like, a little bit more about um, what you're interested in there? Well, I, I, I think that not everybody uh, that comes to this country has a right to come to this country unless they go through some sort of a process. And that's what I'm, I'm attaining. So it's really not an unjust thing for someone to come to this country and to go through a process that's being laid out to become a U.S. citizen. I'm a, I'm a U.S. citizen. I've been naturalized. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea of aborting all the laws just because we're here, uh, it's, there's a little bit of dissonance in that. I, I think that that we should understand that there is a process by which we can come in. There's a lot of unjust stuff going on. I can mm -hmm. tell you stories galore. Yeah. And I would, but sometimes I'm interested to find out the genesis of those laws and how they came about. Yeah. Many years ago, you know, when the Chinese came to work, mm -hmm. they were not permitted to marry uh, U.S. citizens and uh, stuff like that. So there's a lot of abuse, I, I can understand that. But there's also a process by which we can achieve a, a potential in this country that we would not have in our countries of origin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think making those distinctions is, is important. Um, and I don't necessarily think that there shouldn't be any process by which um, uh, people sort of become full members of society. Here's the question, though, for me, theologically. Like, let's go back to theology. Theologically. Um, where's my Bible? Anybody got a Bible? Yeah. I see a Bible. We, we don't have Bible. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do theology, not Bible. <laughs> um, just kidding, just kidding. Um, So it might be legitimate for states, nation states, to differentiate treatment of citizens and non-citizens. Maybe. Maybe that's okay. But I don't think it is for Christians. And here's why. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. All right, we all know that one. But then it keeps going. <clears throat> the alien who resides with you shall be to you as what? As the citizen. The alien shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So yeah, okay, maybe it's okay for states to make some distinctions between treatment of citizens and non-citizens. Maybe. I'll, um, I'll uh, sort of allow that for now. But for Christians, no. I don't think, it's, I don't think that that is permissible on theological grounds. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I was in a church some years ago, Spanish-speaking church, and they had a time for uh, prayer requests. And uh, one of them stood up and said, please, I want you to pray because my cousin is coming through the border last night, right, tomorrow night. Pray that the Lord will blind immigration and that God would grant wisdom to the coyotes. Mm -hmm. I, I was puzzled how I was going to pray that prayer. Mm -hmm. But the whole church erupted in prayer, asking for the coyotes to have wisdom mm -hmm. and could bring people across the border without any problems. So you go figure. I yeah. pray with church. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an interesting story. Um, and I want us to, I like heard some chuckles. But I want us to sit with that for a minute. What would it be like to be in that church and to hear that prayer? And then to tell that person who asks for that prayer, and I'm not saying, Enrique, that, that you did this, but what if one of us, like, were to laugh at that prayer and say, no, that's not a legit prayer. Let me tell you how you should really pray. I don't know. Maybe there's something to that prayer. Maybe there's something to it. Um, I'm not saying entirely, but maybe that's, that prayer is pointing to a wound that we need to attend to. Um, and unfortunately, our churches are so divided that we don't hear those prayers, right? So many churches that are filled with citizens never hear the prayers of non-citizens. And that's a serious problem. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I think, oh, yeah, here. Yeah. Just a quick question. You said that we should put pressure on the uh, SCOTUS. Oh, what yes. are some specific ways that we can do that? So there's a recent book, and I don't endorse all of it. Um, in fact, there are a couple, there are like several chapters that I don't endorse. Um, but a guy who works, um, I for, uh, let's see, what is his name? ACLU. Um, David Cole. He wrote a recent book that talks about the way in which um, activism um, around various issues often raises the Supreme Court's awareness of topics that like you can see them changing their mind on opinions over a really long period of time. And so, I mean, the ones that he uses are like um, I think he uses like abortion issues and Second Amendment rights, and he, I don't think that he's necessarily saying like 
wow, it's so great that like abortion rights have been expanded, or it's so great that um, gun rights have been understood in these new ways. I think his point is that look at how political pressure, popular opinion can change the way that these, you know, supposedly neutral actors uh, think about matters. So I think um, uh, thinking up ways to, um, to follow that sort of a model, I mean like even, even the fact that I'm mentioning this to us, right? Like we usually think of the Supreme Court as so distant for us, but like they go to grocery stores. They, I mean maybe some of them go to churches, right? And so they watch the news. And so maybe like what we do as churches and communities and um, community organizations, maybe that can have an impact um, on, on their decisions down the line. I mean, I have to pray to God that um, the minds of the people on the Supreme Court right now can change. I pray to God that that can happen, right? And um, I believe that it can. Um, you were saying that immigrants are not dangerous, and I was wondering what you meant by it, because I thought that was a little bit generalizing. It's like saying people are not dangerous. It's like yeah. grouping a whole bunch of things together, because yeah. there's always going to be different sects of people sure. that are dangerous, but you commented saying immigrants are not dangerous. Yeah. Take Europe, for example, I think. They have a immigration, they call it immigration crisis because there's just so much crime going on with the influx of immigration coming in. I think Sweden has like problems because there's people bringing bombs, they're threatening people, killing people. Uh, I think there's rape going on as well. But the kind of immigrants that are coming are a different crowd. I think Germany, Germany is a, uh, having an increase in crime and they're attributing like 90% of the increase in crime to male immigrants that are coming in in the recent days and there's like summits going on on how they can fix the issue but I just thought it was a very different issue with the states. Sure, um, so I don't know about those statistics so I can't speak to those. The statistics that I can speak to are uh, the ones that I mentioned earlier. Number one, immigrants commit less crime Non-citizens commit less crime than citizens. That's a pretty straightforward statistic. Yeah, of course, some, uh, I mean, no, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Non-citizens commit less crime than citizens. That's just statistically the case. And then secondly, um, the other one that I put up there was that uh, we often think of extremism and terrorism only in terms of with one face the face of radical Islam or whatever, but white nationalism can be terrorism too. And this report, um, or can take terroristic uh, 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 form as well. Um, and so this report that I was looking at, really, really de uh, detailed, um, shows that actually white nationalists are far more dangerous than Islamists um, because they've attacked more, they've been incarcerated less, and they have stronger recruiting networks. I just, I just wanted to give a little bit of insight in terms of what he, he was talking about. Those statistics are coming from nationalist groups, okay? And even there had been a, an issue discussed not too long ago where our president had quoted uh, a circumstance and um, he was actually kind of dressed down by the ambassador in one of the countries you mentioned because those statistics are not coming from the actual countries things it's coming nationalists like the equivalent of say some in like in Germany some of them are coming from from neo-nazi groups uh. And in the Netherlands, they're coming from th the different groups that are having far-right movements, and they're the ones that are giving these. The real statistics aren't that way at all. 
that's not really what's happening. I'm sorry to say. Okay, this goes way back to the guy with the yellow shirt on that had the question. I was just going to make a follow-up comment on yes. that, so it's kind of a moot point now. But I was just going to say, with the coyotes that are sneaking people across the border, the prayer should be that we have immigration reform, because the more our immigration is improved and inform reformed, the less we're going to have coyotes yeah. secreting people across and putting their lives in danger to get into the nation. The yeah. Amen. Amen. Hi, I'm Terry Merrick. Um, so Justin, I'm wondering if you can help me with this. Um, so I do a lot of talking before city boards on why we should support SB oh, yes. 54. You're, you're trying to rope me into something. No, well I'm trying to get you to help me because um, one of the arguments that, and I find it compelling, yeah. um, so you know, and people will get up and everyone will say their thing, um, but the argument that actually I find compelling is, and it, it is picking up on Enrique's, is people that are arguing, look, I came here legally, I stood in line, why can't, you know, and so it's unfair for people that didn't stand in line to, you know, be allowed in. So, I mean, I, I, so part of me wants to say, well, look, if the system is unjust, then issues about fairness are irrelevant. But I think that's wrong, and this is my philosopher hat now. Yeah. Um, because, look, I mean, in some sense, we're always living in an unjust system, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I'm, um, so imagine a system that, oh, okay, here's a good example. So my dad's friend was Danny Cardona. Um, he could only um, swim in the Covina pool here in the 50s on Wednesday because they cleaned it on Thursday. Okay, so unjust system. So let's imagine on Wednesday, um, everybody's lined up to get into the pool, and Danny's standing in line, and somebody else jumps ahead of him to get into line. It seems like Danny can say, mm -hmm. this is unfair. Mm -hmm. And that's a legitimate claim, mm -hmm. even though the system itself is unfair. So how, I guess, I'm, you know, give me a good response to this argument, because yeah. it's one I hear consistently, right. yeah. and, and I think it needs to be addressed. So, um, undocumented migrants are not jumping any line. They're not jumping in front of the line. So like that, that uh, example that you gave suggests that someone cuts in front of them. When an undocumented migrant comes, she or he doesn't cut in front of anybody. They just come. And the line keeps going. So it's a, it's a different, that analogy isn't quite right. Um, it's, it's more like your friend is waiting to get into the pool, um, and then what happens is that the pool just ends up being more crowded than it would have been otherwise, right? Um, he's still allowed in, but other people are there that, you know, like jumped over the fence or whatever. That's a, that's a good analogy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right? Yeah. So the second thing I'll say to that too, though, is that um, I think so. So let's let's like get a little clearer about the injustice of the situation. Let's get a little clearer about this because the U.S. Um, allots to Me Mexico the same number of visas that it allots to people in sub-Saharan Africa. Which you think, okay, that's cool. That's like fair. Except, except that Mexico's right there. Or maybe it's like right there. I'm not sure where we are right here. But you know what I mean. You can walk here from Mexico. You can't walk here from Sub-Saharan Africa. Moreover, apparently, I mean like at least by our policies, Mexico is supposed to be our friend. In addition, we have a long history of trade relationships with Mexico that we don't have with countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So this isn't to say anything about our policies towards Sub-Saharan Africa. It's, our, it's to say something about our policies towards Mexico and towards other places in Central America. The US, through its economics and through its military practices, has helped to create the conditions 
that people in those countries want to leave. And we have a responsibility to accept people whose countries we destabilize. NAFTA helped to destabilize Mexico's economy. Um, all the civil wars in Central America that the U.S. was all up in their business, we have responsibility. We continue to give money to the people who are uh, repressing their people in Honduras. We con sorry, we continue to give guns to them. The guns that are repressing their people come from us. We have a responsibility to accept people from countries we are destabilizing. So, 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 so like, let's get real clear on what the injustice of the situation is. Um, because it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's more than just like, we should accept more people or something like that. It's, it's more complicated than that. There, there's there's um, uh, more texture to the history and the social relations, right? Great question. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Hello. Ashworth. Hello. <laughs> um, so you kind of already answered my question, but I think I'm still going to ask it because maybe you have something else to add. Um, when I have this conversation with my dad who has... Um, quite different political views than I do. Um, his response to me is always about taxes. Mm. Um, and it's always about that, like, as citizens, we pay certain taxes. And when undocumented uh, migrants come to the US, they get out of those taxes, yeah. um, sort of thing. And so I'm wondering, like, yeah. And I'm always like, I don't know how to respond to yeah. you because yeah. I don't know enough on this topic. So yeah. how would you respond? Um, shoot me an email and I'll give you like some resources for this. But the long and the short of it is this. Um, folks who come here without proper paperwork, um, they want to work just like the rest of us, right? They want to be able to um, pay the bills. Um, eat food, provide for their families, and so how do they do it? They make up a social security number. And that means that they are getting taxed. So taxes are being taken out of their paycheck and they're going to some other social security number and they will never reap the benefits of that social security number and those taxes. So actually, in terms of taxes, Undocumented migration is kind of like a benefit <laughs> to American society. Um, now, it's more complicated than that, of course, but um, that's something that's often overlooked, is that um, undocumented migrants do pay taxes. Now, you could say, well, they shouldn't have made up the social security number in the first place. All right, all right, but you go live in a, really, uh, in a country where it's really hard to find work. Um, you go live in a place um, where you're struggling to feed your family and you would do anything to keep them alive and then tell me how you feel about making up a social security number. Um, hi, uh, hey. Dr. Ashworth. Um, so one of the things that uh, I was thinking about was what you said about migrant workers and one of the things that I've learned through um, a lot of my sociology classes was that a lot of workers come to the US to work for a season and then they do go back to Mexico because yeah. um, their families are f they're based there. And so they, because the social economic system is not um, a place where they can find jobs, they come to the US to find jobs so that way they can support their families. And so my question is, is how does the US or Christians in the US then also support Mexico in creating jobs in their country, not because we don't, we want to be exclusive, but sure, because sure. we also want to like take the burden off of them yeah. from having to migrate because yeah. that is a very difficult thing for them to continually do year after year. Totally. I mean, most people, I, I, this, this probably isn't too much of a gross generalization, but probably most people don't want to have to leave their country in order to survive. Like, that's, you know, you do that because you have to. Um, and so uh, raising the question of economic conditions um, in the countries that people leave uh, is really important. Um, and so uh, I think that you, know, you address those issues uh, with disciplines that I'm kind of like, frankly, not totally 
able to, um, to deal with um, because I lack those capacities, like international relations and economics and this sort of stuff. Um, I did major in economics, but not in this sort of stuff. Um, but there are, um, yeah, I think, I think if the U.S. thought truly of Mexico as a friend um, with whom it was partnering, rather than um, in terms of an enemy whose people we need to keep out, then I think that we might be more interested in investing in Mexico or in other countries where people are leaving for economic reasons, right? Now, there are lots of reasons why people leave countries. Economics is not the only one. That is an important reason, but it's not the only one. The people who are crossing the border um, and getting their families separated, mostly, mostly those people were fleeing violence. Now, that's related to poverty, but it's not quite the same sort of thing. So, yeah, great question. I don't, I'm trying to formulate the question, um, but in, uh, and I apologize for kind of going into somewhat of a different direction, but um, I kind of want to complicate um, kind of the way in which we're connecting family separation to legal status, migration, um, and immigration. Good. Um, and because we, the way in which we're, we, we're talking about them in the kind of current political moment and in some senses in the scope of this discussion, right, mm -hmm. is that uh, those things are kind of together. Yeah. Uh, and in some ways they are. Yeah. But right. I think the, the concept of family separation separate from, right, so it's, a, it's not that we should have these views of um, migration because of the family, family separation, right? That's a separate issue. But also, I mean, family separation is an issue that is central to the development and current practices of citizens here as well. Yep. Um, and this also kind of going to like membership theory. Yep. Um, and so our foster care system yep. it, and the war on drugs and yeah. the ways in which, I mean, that was central to family, like family separation was fundamental to that. Um, and we kind of see the ways in which that's changing now when we talk about opioids yeah. and, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so I'm invoking right issues of class, race. Absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, I wonder like how is it that I think these things in some way should be kind of talked to either we can't separate the concept of family separation yeah. from practices that continue in, in this country as well. Yeah. Issues of membership status and even kind of other issues around, right, human dignity versus not, mm -hmm. family separation versus, and, and these, uh, and the ways in which those aren't making its way into this discussion. Yeah. Um, because I think there's a pair, like there's yeah. a connection. Yeah, I mean, the U.S. has a very long history of separating families. Yeah. This is so un-American to separate families. I thought, mm, remember what we uh, did to like all those uh, slave families? Remember what we did to Native Americans? Putting them in boarding schools? That's recent history, y'all. I mean, fami family separation is like as American as apple pie, right? I mean, that might be going just a little bit far, but Right? There's a long history, and it's always racialized, too. Always racialized. It's never white people whose families are separated um, in these ways. Right? So, but what I was interested in was what you were saying about how it's continuing into the present day. Tell me something more about that, because... Uh, I think about like even foster care, right? Yeah. And so the ways in which we haven't even talked about foster care or the foster care system as an institution yeah. um, when we're talking about this family separation yeah. because, right, even in the um, efforts to reunify families, right, now there's all these other conversations about should they be reunified? Do they fit the criteria for what? Yeah. And so what are the ways in which even what a decent family is oh, or right. and and how right th that's something that is kind of not making its way into the conversation yeah. because we still yeah. rest on these kind of central assumptions that yeah. about security and safety mm -hmm. and what that looks like and what that means and the ways in which i think the foster care system is drastically ignored yeah. um in our country today as well yeah, um, yeah. totally uh, it sounds like you and my dean need to have a conversation because he is very passionate 
about these issues. Um, uh, and I don't know that I could say too much more to that. I feel like I just learned a lot um, about all the things I need to go and study about foster care. Um, so um, is there a particular question that you want me to address in that? Or? I'm sorry, yeah. No, that's okay. I, I, like, that's all right. What are the ways in which perhaps when we complicate this, we might also, in our efforts to think about this um, current issue, also be um, ignoring current contemporary practices that aren't making its way into its discussion. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I'll have to. Th I'll, th I'll have to think more about that. I, I really appreciate it, though. Um, yeah. Thank you. So, um, by the way, family separation. All you have to do is watch the movie Three Identical Strangers, and um, if you haven't seen it yet, anyway. Um, uh, I th uh, regarding the gentleman's question up front here, I, I th would you agree that one of the reasons, um, one of the answers, uh, part of the answer is, oh, you can use James K. Smith's uh, concept of cultural liturgies. Mm -hmm. We've been shaped by the American religion. It's, mm -hmm. an, it's a religion. It has mm -hmm. hymns, saints, um, co liturgical colors, everything. Yeah. Um, that's in competition with the cultural litur uh, cult the liturgy of the church. Mm -hmm. And so part of it, and I know because you, you study with Stanley, um, who always says you, you can only act in a world you can say. Yes. And, no, say, well, see, but say. Um, because we've learned a language, and there's a difference between um, thinking of somebody, for instance, as an undocumented worker, 50% yeah. of which are the workers in California, as uh, 2017 statistics. So we remember that when we eat our fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Um, and an illegal alien. Mm -hmm. And oh, so yeah. we learn language in the church and we learn language in the cultural liturgy and it shapes the way that we, that we think, which is kind of a meta, um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's underlying all of this, yeah. right? The language yeah. that we learn to see people a certain way yeah. and therefore we act toward them that way, right? Um, naming has been a really important issue um, in this. Remember, I talked about securitization theory is about naming something and someone a threat. And I think one thing that we have to do is to rename things theologically. So migrants, I mean, this is as like uh, non-threatening, as straightforward a definition as you can get. Migrants are just distant neighbors who have come near. That's it. Please give a big round of applause to Dr. Justin. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming. Good night.